Apple's new MacBook Air proved that its M1 chip is a pretty powerful beast, even in such a thin and light machine. It was so good, it made me wonder if the 13-inch MacBook Pro with the M1 could even be that much better. The chip is the same across both machines, save for one missing GPU core on the base MacBook Air. So why pay more, especially when the equivalent MacBook Air is hundreds less than the Pro? The simple answer really is that the MacBook Pro has a fan, whereas the Air is passively cooled with just a heatsink. And that lone fan lets the MacBook Pro stay very fast for sustained workloads, so things like video rendering or 3D encoding, whereas the Air can actually slow down over time as it heats up. So it turns out really that this MacBook Pro really is meant for professionals, though its limitations may turn off plenty of users. But let's cover the basics first. Like the M1 equipped Air, this retooled MacBook Pro is physically identical to the previous model. It has the same aluminum case, it still has only two USB-C ports, and it's still pretty portable at three pounds. It would have been nice to see Apple attempt a serious redesign, especially one that further differentiated the Pro from the Air, which is a mere 0.2 pounds lighter. Plenty of PC makers are pushing their 13-inch ultra portables below two and a half pounds, so I'm sure Apple can manage that. The MacBook Pro's 13.3-inch screen is 100 nits brighter than the Air's, but otherwise the computers share the same 2560 by 1600 Retina display. The Pro also has Apple's Touch Bar, which provides touchscreen shortcuts to basic system functions and apps. I've never been a huge fan of it, but at least Apple has refined it to make room for a physical escape key and power and touch ID button. Personally, the fact that the Air doesn't have a touch bar makes me prefer it even more. Beyond that, the MacBook Pro packs in the refined keyboard Apple unveiled earlier last year, which offers a much more comfortable typing experience and is far more reliable than the flat butterfly keyboard models. Now let's focus on what makes this MacBook Pro so special, Apple's new M1 SoC. That chip packs a punch with eight CPU cores and up to eight GPU cores. It's built on a five nanometer process, which is even more intricate than AMD's seven nanometer chips. Intel, meanwhile, doesn't expect to have any seven nanometer hardware until 2020. By betting on a five nanometer ARM-based design, Apple has managed to craft something that's both powerful and energy efficient. The only downside is that it's a completely different architecture than the x86 Intel chips Apple previously relied on. So older apps have to run through the Rosetta 2 emulator to function. After being blown away by the power of the MacBook Air M1, I was really expecting a similar experience on the MacBook Pro, maybe with a bit more power. And that's pretty much what I saw with our review model, which was equipped with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a one terabyte SSD alongside the M1 chip. It booted up almost instantly the first time I lifted the lid and I went through the setup process very quickly. Compared to Apple's recent Intel equipped MacBook Pros, the M1 model feels ridiculously fast. Apps launch within seconds, Safari loads enormous websites in the blink of an eye, and I can juggle a variety of software, including Evernote, Slack, Spotify, and multiple web browsers without having the system break a sweat. I didn't run into any issues emulating Intel apps either. In most cases, apps like Evernote felt even faster than running them on an x86 PC. Developers are also quickly updating their apps to run natively on the M1. Even Google wasted no time delivering an optimized version of Chrome after a few slight hiccups. Since the M1 chip is based on the same architecture as Apple's mobile hardware, it can also run iOS and iPad apps. I didn't find that to be very useful in the MacBook Pro though. It was more of a curiosity. It's also something developers can opt out of entirely, so don't expect to find Google or Facebook on the Mac App Store. You can play plenty of games on the MacBook Pro too, thanks to the M1's powerful GPU cores. Just like on the MacBook Air, I was able to run Fortnite smoothly in 720p. That's impressive since it's running via Rosetta 2 emulation. But Fortnite is also pretty buggy since Apple hasn't updated it in months due to their ongoing legal battle with Apple. Apple Arcade titles like The Pathless and The Last Campfire ran flawlessly at 60 frames per second. But that's not too surprising since they also run really well on the iPhone and iPad. When it comes to gaming on computers, Apple has always lagged behind Windows PCs. But I really wonder if developers will start to take a closer look at Macs now that they see the power of these M1 chips and the amount of performance they can bring to computers like the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro. Even though the MacBook Pro is equipped with a fan, I rarely heard it turn on. You really have to stress the system with something like a lengthy video rendering job to make that spin up. And when it does kick in, it's still far quieter than it usually is on Intel machines. That's likely because it doesn't have to work as hard to keep things cool. Even under heavy workload, the system felt warm to the touch, but not scorching hot like some earlier models. The MacBook Pro's battery life is yet another example of how efficient the M1 chip can be. The system lasted 16 and a half hours during our battery benchmark, which involves looping a video. At the end of a typical workday, it usually has around seven hours of juice left. 
As impressive as this MacBook Pro is, I'll admit it doesn't feel that much different than the MacBook Air during my typical daily workflow. Even the Geekbench scores between the systems are practically identical. That's a testament to how powerful the M1 chip is uh, and the fact that Apple was just able to cram in so much power in something that could still run on a thin and light machine like the Air with no fan. But once you start looking at the M1 chip through the eyes of more professional users, its flaws become a lot more glaring. The biggest issue with this system is that it's limited to 16 gigabytes of RAM, which means it's not ideal for working with large files or serious media work. The M1 chip also only supports one external display, so anyone sporting dual monitors on their desk is out of luck. There is a workaround for more external displays using DisplayPort adapters and the DisplayLink software, but that's not officially supported by Apple. There's also no support for external GPUs, something that's admittedly a bit niche, but a huge downside for anyone using those devices to beef up their graphics performance at home or at work. All these concerns are why Apple is still offering Intel-powered MacBook Pros, which still support up to 32 gigabytes of RAM, multiple displays, and eGPUs. If you're a professional who relies on very specific apps and plugins, you may also run into some issues with Apple's M1 emulation. If you're looking for an easy way to track which apps are optimized for M1 chips or don't even work at all, I'd really recommend checking out the site Is Apple Silicon Ready? At the time of this review, Avid, Pro Tools, Autodesk, Revit, and a slew of music apps don't even run on M1 systems properly. Given all these caveats, I'd recommend that Pro users do some serious research before buying any M1 Mac, especially the MacBook Pro. If you're intrigued by the power of Apple's SoC, the MacBook Air may be the better option when you can snap it up for $1449 with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a 512 gigabyte SSD. The MacBook Pro, meanwhile, starts at $1299 with just eight gigabytes of RAM and a 256 gigabyte SSD. You'll have to pay $1,700 to double both specs. And if you desperately need a new MacBook Pro soon for work, then don't count out the existing Intel offerings. They may have weaker graphics than the M1, but at least there's no compatibility headache involved. While Apple's M1 chip made the MacBook Air feel revolutionary, it's a bit more complicated with the MacBook Pro. It's still a fast and efficient machine, but there are a lot of compatibility issues that professionals